Welcome back, Pickens Chemistry students. So this is gonna be the second video in our timeline of atomic discoveries and models. So we're going to continue post 1900. So pre 1900, we have Thomson kind of formalizing the idea that atoms are divisible and that he was able to do that along with the discovery of radioactivity showing that there was energy and particles coming out from atoms, sometimes on its own, um, and that other atoms could be split specifically into negative charges very easily. And those negative charges that Thomson could split the atoms into, we now know are electrons, and that electrons are in fact the same thing as beta particles. So post 1900, we have Ernst Rutherford, who was alive from 1871 to 1937. Um, you may notice that he was a little bit younger than Thompson, but he actually passed away just before Thompson. And Rutherford was one of Thompson's students. And Rutherford set out in 1911 to prove Thompson's model of the atom and that the atom was indeed made of a mostly positively charged sphere with several embedded negative electrons that could be removed from it. But recall that also around the same time as Thomson's work, that Henri Becquerel and Marie Curie were in the middle of discovering radioactivity and discovering new elements. And so what Rutherford did was he got some um, polonium and radium, probably radium, he got radium from Marie Curie and he used that radium, which was emitting those alpha particles. Remember that those alpha particles were basically the nucleus of a helium-4. And relative to the other types of radioactivity, they were pretty heavy. And they had a positive charge of two. So heavy, positively charged alpha particles, OK? And what Rutherford did was he took that radium from Marie Curie and he beat a very thin piece of foil, gold foil, so thin that it would only be a few atoms thick. And his hypothesis was that if the positive charge in the gold foil was spread out within the atom, then it would not really disturb the path of the alpha particles that much. And that the alpha particles would behave in a way that would basically take them straight through the plum pudding atom, Thomson's model. And so here on the left side of the screen is a, a square that's supposed to represent that very thin piece of gold foil. It shows us in the middle here what one of the atoms would look like if it was a plum pudding model of the gold atom. And we've got over here on the left side, we've got our alpha particles. And so we can turn our alpha particles on and we can see what happens to those as they pass through the plum pudding. We can put traces on to see that they basically go straight through. We can increase the energy to show that they still pass straight through. We can decrease the energy to show that even when they're slow, they're still passing straight through. This is what would have been expected. This is what Rutherford expected to observe when he looked at where the alpha particles came out on the other side of the gold foil. Now, if you're a good scientist, you should be saying, well, how did Rutherford know that he had seen an alpha particle? If it took so long for us to discover these as scientists, if we can't really see the nucleus with the naked eye, and that's a great question. How did he see it? Well, it works the same way as the fluorescent bulbs do. With the fluorescent bulbs, there are electrons in the bulb that collide with the wall and that cause that wall to give off light. Specifically, there's a coating on the wall of a material called a, called a phosphor that gives off light when it's struck by energetic particles like electrons or like alpha particles. And there's a compound called zinc sulfide that you can put onto sheets of plastic or very thin pieces of glass and he created a screen around this experiment and he had a bunch of his own students who were watching different sections of the screen. 
to see when those sections of the screen would light up. The only problem was he did not observe all of these passing straight through. What he actually observed, and what we now see is the Rutherford model of the atom, was that when he turned these on, and this is gonna be, let me show you the smaller view first. No, let me do the big view. This would be like the gold foil with the stacks of atoms next to each other, okay? And so the atom target right now is a gold, okay? And we're gonna just keep our alpha energy at the same energy and we'll go ahead and turn on the traces. Now, if this was the plum pudding model, all of the alpha particles would pass straight through. Notice that most do, but there are a few here that are being scattered in very large angles. And so what's going on? Well, the alpha particles are pretty highly charged with pretty low mass. And the idea is that as they approach the nucleus, the nucleus has so many protons in it that it actually pushes the alpha particles away. And so this is more in line with what Rutherford observed where the students he had sitting around that screen observed flashes of light, not just behind the atoms, because of course most of the particles would pass through, but a few particles that came close to the nucleus or any of the nuclei would actually be scattered backwards, not necessarily straight back towards his source of alpha particles, but back towards the front side of the screen. So because Rutherford observed the behavior of alpha particles moving through gold foil, he came to propose that atoms were divisible units composed of positive charges in nucleus with negative charges surrounding or orbiting the nucleus. His other discovery at the same time was that based on his calculations, the nucleus actually had to have something else there giving it mass. There was an extra mass in the nucleus that on its own could not be explained by the protons that he understood to be making up the nucleus. And so, this is the first evidence for there being a neutral particle in the nucleus of the atom. Rutherford's model then is of a nucleus, which is extremely small compared to the rest of the atom, that these electrons are moving around the nucleus, and that most of the atom is empty space. So then Rutherford, and I'm gonna jump ahead in a year just to include it here. So Rutherford is the one who proposed that there was something else in the nucleus with extra mass. And in 1932, Chadwick discovered for sure, found proof, discovered the neutron. So he actually had proof. Previous to that, after Rutherford's discovery, chemists and scientists generally accepted that there was some sort of an extra neutral particle in the nucleus, but they didn't have the proof for doing so. So neutrons were discovered less than 100 years ago. And then, again, I said I was jumping up. Shortly after Rutherford, there was Niels Bohr, who was alive from 1885 to 1962. And he proposed this model in 1913 
And what he did was he observed the emission spectra and absorption spectra of different gases, namely different elements. And so what's building up here right now is the emission spectra for hydrogen. And there's not a lot here so far. And one of the problems is some of the specific colors don't have very high probabilities for being produced. But what's shown here is that there's a stream of electrons coming in and striking a hydrogen atom. Maybe if I slow this down a little bit, we'll get a few of the other ones. And that depending on the energy that's absorbed by the atom that is then given back off again in the form of light, you see different colors of light. So here we see this violet color. There's also this very pale blue that's just barely building up. And there's another one here that's red, okay? This would be hydrogen. And when we look at hydrogen, hydrogen has a specific fingerprint. I could change the potential there too, but I want to keep it up around 23, I think. Um, there we go. Da, 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 da. Stop and change. So let's go ahead and look at, say, sodium. And if I switch to sodium, which is going to be a different element, so we were just looking at hydrogen. But now when we look at sodium, we should see several more colors building up. Maybe there's not enough coming in. Maybe it's too high. Oh, because it stopped. So with sodium, what's nice is that we will see several colors. Maybe you've heard of sodium being used before in lamps and sodium gives off a very bright orange and a very bright yellow color. And so you can see those being built up here as those photons of light get given off by the atom. And we could do the same thing. We could look at neon. Here's neon. Too high. Not excited, okay. Mercury, there we go. Mercury is often used as a standard for calibrating spectrometer instruments, instruments that are used to look at light. Try and get a few other colors in here. There we go. There's a few more coming in now. You see a pretty dark blue, almost violet. There's green, yellow, red. We should be able to see a lot of lines in here from mercury. And the nice thing with looking at all these is that all these different colors of light that are given off almost act like fingerprints. And so not only do specific elements give off specific colors of light, but those same elements will absorb specific colors of light. And so what Niels Bohr looked at was the absorption and emission of light energy by atoms. This is also after, I should say, 1905 was when Einstein received the Nobel, Nobel Prize in physics for explaining the photoelectric effect.
So it was known that light on its own could cause electrons to be ejected from matter or electrons to be ejected from atoms. And so Bohr had an understanding that this light was both exciting electrons and could be given off by electrons in the atom. And that the only way to explain that, so he basically took the Rutherford model of the nucleus and added in the idea that electrons only existed in specific energy levels. And that because those electrons only existed in specific energy levels, they could only pass between specific levels, which means they could only absorb or emit specific amounts of energy. And that that was where the fingerprints were coming from for all of this stuff. After Bohr, then of course we've got Einstein who was working on, the, on this at the same time. We've got Schrodinger. We've got Gamov. We've got um, uh, Otto Hahn. We've got all kinds of physicists and chemists and what they really come up with post 1913 Oh, um, Hamilton, no, not Hamilton. He was before then. Um, what they really come up with then is the quantum model of the atom. And will it be exploring the quantum model of the atom more in depth when we start, talk specifically about electrons? So that's gonna be a later unit, okay? So pre-1900, atoms were first thought to be indivisible. Then as we came closer to 1900, atoms were understood to be divisible. And then after 1900 with Rutherford and radioactivity, this was really kind of when we started to understand more about the nucleus. And then in the 1920s, 1930s, and even still up till today, this is really the time frame when we've begun to understand the behavior of the electrons in more depth. And so this is just kind of a history of atomic models. You should be able to identify and basically match observations with the observer or specific characteristics or pictures of the models with the observer. Um, here for Bohr, let me say that this is the nucleus. And let me draw it like this with energy levels, E levels where the electrons would exist. And those electrons can move up and move down through those energy levels as they absorb or emit light. Um, and so there will be a quick post video quiz on this before class tomorrow. And then we'll actually jump into something unique for chemistry on this topic during the WebEx. So I hope to see you then.